Hence the scripture speaks differently about Christ's death. Sometimes it saith, He died for us sinners and enemies. And in other places, John fifteen thirteen, He layeth down his life for his friends and his sheep. John seventeen nineteen, He saith, He praiseth, he prayeth, excuse me, and sanctifieth himself for those that shall believe in him, that is, in a consequent sense, for those who by faith shall lay hold on his death. So that faith hath a twofold condition, the first of the time when sins are taken away by Christ's death, and that is when they believe, secondly, of whom these privileges are true, and that is, of such who do believe. Now all this may be the further cleared, if we consider what kind of cause Christ's death is to take away our sins, it is a meritorious cause, which is in the rank of moral causes, of which the rule is not true. Posita causa sequitur effectus. The cause being the effect presently followeth. This holdeth the natural causes which necessarily produce their effects, but moral causes work according to the agreement and liberty of the persons that are moved thereby. As for example, God the Father is moved through the death of Christ to pardon the sins of such persons for whom he died. This agreement is to be made good, and that time they shall pitch up in their transaction. Now, it pleased the Father that the benefits and fruits of Christ's death shall be applied, or should be applied unto the believer, and not till he did believe, though this faith be at the same time also a gift of God through Christ. It is good, therefore, when we either call election absolute, or say Christ died absolutely, to consider that absolute may be taken as opposite to a prerequisite condition, which is to be fulfilled by us, so that upon this election and the fruits of Christ's death shall depend. Or else absolute may be taken as it opposeth any means or order which God hath appointed as the way to obtain the end, and in this latter sense, it would be a grand absurdity to say, election is absolute, or Christ died absolutely. For if this were so, the profane argument about election would have truth in it. If I be elected, let me live never so wickedly, I shall be saved. In the Arminian argument, that every one were bound to believe that Christ died for him, though wicked and abiding so, would not well be avoided. His last argument is from the unchangeableness of God's love. If we are not justified in his sight before we believe, then God did once hate us and afterwards love us. And this be so, and if this be so, excuse me, why should Arminians be blamed for saying, we may be the children of God today and the children of the devil tomorrow? Hence he concludes it as undoubted that God, that God loved us first before we believe, even when we were in our blood. In answering of this argument, several things are considerable. First, it must be readily granted that God is unchangeable, James 1, verse 7. God is there compared to the Son, and is therefore called the Father of lights, but yet is preferred before it, because that hath clouds sometimes cast over it, and sometimes is in eclipse. But there is no change or shadow of change with him. The heathens have confessed this, and so argued, if God should change, it would be either for better or worse. For worse, how could it be imagined? For better, then God were not absolutely perfect. Most accursed, therefore, must Vorstius his blasphemy be, who purposely pleads for mutability in God. But secondly, as this is easily to be confessed, so the difficulty of those arguments brought from the things which God doth in time, and not from all eternity, have been very weighty upon some men's shoulders, insomuch that they thought this the only way to salve all by saying, that all things were from eternity. And certainly by the antinomian arguments we may as well plead for the creation of all things from eternity, as that we are justified from all eternity. For all are equally built upon this sandy foundation, that because the things are done in time, therefore there must be some new act or will or love in God, which would imply God is mutable, not loving today and loving tomorrow. Therefore to avoid this, they say, all is from eternity. Origen, who was called by an ancient writer, Centaure, because of his monstrous opinions, argued thus, Lib 1, De Spiadscone, Cap 2, 
as there cannot be a father without a son, or a master and lord without a possession, so neither an omnip so neither an omnipotent, excuse me, unless there be those things about which this power may be exercised. Now although it be true that de Deo etiam vera dicere periculosum est because of the weakness of our understandings to perceive his infinite luster. Yet thirdly, it is well cleared by the schoolmen that those relations which are attributed to God in time as a creator, father or lord, are not because of any new thing in God, but in respect of the creatures, so that when the world is created, when a man is justified, we say God was not a creator, a God who was not a creator before is a creator, who was not a father by grace is now by grace, not because any new accident is in him, but because there is a new effect in the creatures. Thus, if a man wants the child of wrath, be now a son of God's love. The change is not in God, but in the creature. For the better clearing of this, we are to take notice in the fourth place, that it is one thing as Aquinas observeth, mutare voluntatum, to change the will. Another thing, vile mutationem, a will to change. By the same unchangeable will, we may will several changes in an object as the physician, without any change of his will, may will his patient to take one kind of physic one day, and another the third. Here he wills a change, but, but doth not change his will. Thus God, with the same will, decreed to permit in time such an elect man to be in a state of sin, under the power of Satan, and afterwards to call him out of, his con uh, to call him out of this condition, to justify his person. Here indeed is a great change made in the man, but none at all in God. There is no new act in God which was not from all eternity, though every effect of his love, uh, excuse me, though every effect of this love of God was not from eternity, but in time. Hence when our divines argue against Arminians that if the saints should apostatize, God's love would be changeable, it is meant of God's love of election, which is an absolute purpose and efficacious will bring such a man to glory. Now, although such a degree was free, and so might not have been, yet ex hypothesi, supposing God hath made his decree, it doth very truly follow, that if the saint should not be brought to glory, God would be changeable. And besides this immutability, which may be called an immutability of his nature, there is another of his word and promise, whereby he hath graciously covenanted to put his fear in their heart, that they shall never depart from him. Now, if any of the saints should totally or finally apostatize, God's mutability would be seen in both those respects of his nature or will, and of his truth and fidelity. But the case is not the like. When a man at his first conversion is made a child of wrath, a child of grace, partly because there was no such absolute decree of God from eternity that he should be for no space a child of wrath, but the clean contrary and partly because there is no such word or promise unto any unconverted person, that he shall be in the favor of God, but the scripture declareth the clean contrary. This duly considered will give a clear reason why it is no good argument to say such a man in his sins today is a child of wrath and converted tomorrow is a son of grace. Therefore God is changeable. But on the other side, if a man should argue an elect man received into the state of, God, uh, into the state of grace, may fall totally and finally, therefore God has changed, would be a strong and undeniable inference. And indeed for this particular, may the Arminians be challenged as holding God's mutability, because they hold that notwithstanding God's decree and purpose to save such a man, yet a man by his own corruption and default shall frustrate God of this his intention. Otherwise, all know Adam was created in a state of God's favor and quickly apostatized into the contrary. So that we may truly say, Adam was one day, yea, hour as some, a child of God's favor, and in another of his wrath. Yet the change was in Adam, not in God, both because God had not made an absolute decree from all eternity for his standing, as also because he had made no promise to preserve him in that happy condition. In this sense, 1 Peter 2, verse 10, it is said, Which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 
And whereas the opponent saith, God loved us before we did believe, it is true, with a love of purpose, but many effects of his love are not exhibited till we do believe. He loveth us, and so worketh one effect of love in us, that that effect may be qualified for a now and further effect of love. He loveth us to make us his friends, and when he hath done that, he loveth us with a love of friendship. God loved us before he gave Christ. For out of that love he gave us Christ, and so when Christ has given us, he may bestow another love upon us. Now because it is ordinary with us to call the effect of love, love, as the fruit of grace is grace, therefore we may say, in such a time God loved not one, and afterwards we say, he doth love the same. Not that herein is any change of God, but several effects of his love are exhibited. As we call the effects of God's anger, his anger, poena, patientis, ira, esse, creditur, desernentis, the punishment on the offender is judged the anger of the inflictor. And by this means we may say, excuse me, we say sometimes God is angry, and afterwards he ceaseth to be angry when he removeth these effects of his anger. So a man is said to be loved or not to be loved according to the effects of God's love exhibited in time. And God hath so appointed it that one effect of his love should be a qualification in the subject for another as sanctification for glorification.